Well, good morning again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we are excited about what you have for us today as we begin this new series called Surprise the World. Father, may you help us to live our lives in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you, which is surprising to most. Father, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you have ever been surprised? Raise your hand if you've ever had a good surprise in your life. That's good. Um, How many of you like surprises, just in general? That's what I find, about half of us. Half of us are like, no, just leave me out of the surprise thing. But uh, the other half of us are like, I I need a good surprise every now and then, don't I? Because we enjoy them. I think, though, we have all uh, been surprised by something, by someone at some time in our life. And we've probably also learned this about surprises. Some surprises are good and some surprises are bad. (laughs) There, There are both good and bad surprises in life. For example, a a surprise rain shower when the the meteorologist, the weatherman said there's no chance of rain and then you got some, that's a good surprise. But a hole in your roof in the middle of a rainstorm is not a good surprise, right? A surprise bonus from your boss. Your boss comes up to you and says, hey, I got a bonus for you. Thanks for all the hard work you've been doing. Praise God. That's a great surprise, right? Right? But when the boss comes up to you on Friday and says, hey, you know what, I'm going to need you to come in this weekend and uh, put in an extra shift, that's not a good surprise. A surprise visit from somebody you love or maybe somebody you haven't seen in a long time who just shows up and wants to visit with you, that's good. But a surprise visit or knock on the door from the IRS auditor, not so good, right? Right? Have you ever reached into your pocket, maybe a pair of jeans you hadn't worn in a while, and you pulled out a $20 bill? Has that ever happened to y'all? That happened to me just a few weeks ago, and uh, that was a really good surprise. It just put a smile on my face. I was like, man, what little minion went into my closet and put a $20 bill in there? That was great. It's just a $20 bill I left there some time ago. It was a good surprise. But you know what? I also got a bill in the mail that I wasn't expecting that same week, and that was a bad surprise. So the bottom line is this when it comes to surprises, right? Life is full of them, and there's going to be good ones, and there's going to be bad ones. Good surprises and bad surprises, but there will always be surprises. And there have always been surprises, We're kicking off this study by a guy by the name of Michael Frost. It's called Surprise the World. If you're in our small groups, uh, you're going to get a copy of the little book that goes along with it. It's not a big book or a hard book to read. I would encourage you to be in a small group, to get in a small group, to get plugged in. It's it's not too late. We can find a way to get you plugged into a small group if you really want to be. But even if you're not going to get plugged into a small group, I would encourage you to pick up the book because we're going to be going through it as a church over the next couple of weeks. You can get it. I think you can get it at our connection booth uh, on your way out. If you can't get it there, uh, you can certainly get it on Amazon or other places books are sold. It's called Surprise the World by Michael Frost. It's got the same uh, logo that we're using for the the logo um, on your bulletin and stuff. That's the cover of the book, and so you'll be able to recognize that. And the first couple of chapters in this book is, is the author talking about what it looks like for believers, disciples, people like you and me, to surprise the world, to live surprising lives. He uses this term that when you first read it, um, doesn't maybe seem exactly right. He he uses this term called um, living questionable lives. And he doesn't mean that in the sense that we are shady. He doesn't mean that in the sense that our lives are are marked by scandal or controversy. But but what he means that as is we want to live the kind of lives that make people go, hmm, They make people question. 
that make people go, I wonder why he does that, or I wonder why she lives her life that way. What he's really getting at in these first couple of chapters is that, that we as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to be countercultural. We're not supposed to look like everybody else. We're not supposed to look like the world around us. We're, we're supposed to stick out. We're supposed to um, look different. Our lives are supposed to be surprising to the world. Our lives are supposed to be questionable to the point people go, I wonder why they X, Y, Z, right? People should look at us and wonder why we do what we do. And, and when you think about it, I mean, he, he's 100% right. Think about some of the most basic and fundamental things of our faith, the Christian faith. And I realize we're all at different stages in our journey in the faith. We, we have people in our congregation who are retired ministers and have devoted their lives to vocational ministry. And, um, you know, they're at one place. We have, we have other people who've been Christians for longer than most of us have been alive. And they read their Bibles every day and they memorize scripture and, you know, they're, they're deep into it. And then we have people that just got saved last week. They're just getting started. There's people here today probably who don't know Jesus, who are just checking it out. Kind of wondering if maybe God has a plan for their life. So we're all at different places, I get that. But let's just consider some of the most basic, some of the most fundamental aspects of our faith. We're called to forgive our enemies. We're called to turn the other cheek. We're called to tithe a tenth of our income to the Lord, to the church. We're called to feed and to clothe and to minister to those who are less fortunate. We're called in Scripture to be sexually pure, to abstain from sex before marriage. We're called to gather together, to prioritize worship on Sunday mornings, to gather together as the church to worship and to celebrate as you guys are doing this morning, right? There's other places you could be. There's other things you could be doing, but you have prioritized Jesus. You have prioritized the gospel. You have prioritized God's kingdom for this hour, because we're called to it. We're called to die to ourselves and take up our cross daily for Christ. We're called to, to do these radically strange and difficult things like rejoice in suffering. We're called to choose the narrow road and to reject the, the broad road that leads to destruction. We're, we're called to live our lives with the attitude that accepts things like this, like, like the first will be last and the last will be first. These are, the kind, these are the, just the basics of the Christian faith. And those things aren't normal, are they? Those things aren't normal. They just aren't. Those things are surprising when we see them in the world. When we see people doing those kinds of things, it makes us go, hmm, I, I wonder why they do that. It makes people naturally want to ask questions about our questionable lives. Church, can I just tell you, the more radical and the more sinful the world becomes, the more questionable our lives look. We're not called or commanded to look like the world. We're called to look like, to act like, and to live like Jesus. And that is not what the world looks like, in case you haven't noticed. The Apostle Paul, he said it like this in Romans 12 too. He said, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what the good pleasing and perfect will of God is. I want to give you five things that we are not called to. We were going to put these in your bulletin, but we didn't have room for them. There's five things you might want to write down. These are very quickly five things we are not called to. We are not called to satisfy the world. We are not called as believers, as Christians, as the church to make the world happy 
or to satisfy the world. We're not called to seek after the things of the world. Number two, we're not supposed to be people who are chasing worldly things and worldly goods and worldly pleasures and seeking those for our lives and our family. We're not called to side with the world. We're not called to side with one political party or another. That's not what we are called to do. How many of y'all watch football? Be honest, it's okay. Some of y'all do, some of you don't. How many of you know in a football game there's two different teams? Team A and Team B. Because half of y'all don't watch, we gotta start with the basics. It's gonna add 20 minutes to the sermon, but that's okay. Y'all don't raise your hand, you get what you deserve. There's two teams on the field, right? And those teams represent two different kingdoms. Two different cities, two different colleges, two different kingdoms, right? And they're out there representing their kingdom, trying to get what they want for their kingdom. But here's the thing. There's a third team on the field that we tend to forget about, but all of us know they are there. They are called the referees. And they represent the kingdom, They represent the kingdom of the NFL. And the only people on the field who have authority are those referees. There there are fewer of them than anybody else. Yet when they blow the whistle, the whole game comes to a stop. They have the power and the authority to keep everybody in line and everybody in check. They have the power and the authority to represent the kingdom and do what's best for the game, not the kingdoms who are fighting against each other. They don't, or not supposed to, side with one kingdom or the other. They're supposed to be in the middle of it all and then above it all, keeping it all going for the sake of the kingdom, of the sport. Church, we're not called to side with one side or the other. We're called to be in the middle of it all and above it all, representing the kingdom of God. And that means we're going to have to throw the flags and the penalties on both sides. We're going to have to call both teams out. But if we don't, if we get on one side or the other, guess what happens? We lose our authority. And nobody will listen to us. We are not called to side with the world. We're also not called to shun the world. We're not called to just get rid of the world and say we want no part of the world and we have no part of the world and we're not going to participate in the world. We're not called to shun the world. And then here's the fifth one. We are not called to surrender to the world, to give up to the world, to do whatever the world wants us to do. Those are not our callings. But we are called to surprise the world, to surprise the world daily by living questionable lives for Jesus. There may have been a time in American culture when living for Jesus was the normal thing, when that was the normal way that most people, if not almost everybody, lived. If that time ever existed, it was not in my lifetime. In church, I want to say this as honestly as I possibly can. Living your life for the sake of the gospel and in accordance with the calling God has put on your life is not going to be normal in the course of any of our lifetimes. It's just not. In the days to come, it will be harder and harder and harder to be a follower of Jesus. So with that, I submit to you today our big idea, which is this. Living for Christ will always seem questionable to most. Living for Jesus will always seem questionable to most of the people around us. Today, I want you to consider the questionable nature of Jesus himself. The questionable 
nature of his life. After all, according to scripture, we are to model our lives after his life. Amen? We're supposed to be living as he lived. Just a couple of examples of that. First John chapter 2 says, The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. That's you and I. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Colossians 2, 6 and 7, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, what does Paul say? Paul says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. As I imitate Jesus, you imitate me. Because that's who we follow, Jesus. So with that in mind, what I want to show you today is that being abnormal is normal for a Christ follower. That being out of step with the world is normal for those who are in step with Jesus and the gospel. There are three primary areas in Jesus' life and his ministry that were questionable in his day, that people questioned about Jesus. And what I want to tell you today is people are still questioning those things about the people who are choosing to live for Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to walk in his footsteps still today. That living for Jesus, living for Christ, will always seem questionable to most. It always has, and it always will. Consider this, for example, for his entire ministry, People questioned the motives of Jesus. That's point number one, the motives. They questioned his motive for doing what he did. And in a very similar way, people would question the motives of Paul in Scripture and Peter and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and many, many others. And when we're living as Christ has called us to live and doing what Christ has called us to do and going where Christ has called us to to go. When we're living questionable lives, there's no doubt people are going to question our motives as well. Because it's, it's, it's just not normal to love somebody for no reason. It's not normal to help somebody who hasn't helped you first. It's not normal to serve somebody who does not deserve your service. It's not normal to give to somebody for no reason, just to be a generous person. We were in Italy following the footsteps of Paul recently, and we were staying at this one hotel, and it was kind of a mess when we got there and checked in, and to be quite honest, the the little girl working at the front desk, I say little girl, she was probably, I don't know, in her 20s, but you could tell she was fairly new at all of this, and and most of what had happened was her fault. And when we finally got it all sorted out, I could tell she was extremely flustered. And, and she had tried hard, but she was figuring it out. Um, when we finished it all, I said, hey, thank you so much for your help. And I handed her a $20 bill, an American $20 bill. And she looked at that $20 bill, and she looked at me, and she said, what's this for? And I said, just for helping us today. And she said, but I messed everything up. And I said, it's okay. You tried really hard. (laughs) I appreciate it. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. Like, keep trying. And I thought she was going to start crying. She was just, she was just overwhelmed that somebody would bless her for, for no reason. That would give her something that she did not deserve in that moment. And then she said this, she said, I've always been told Americans are generous. And I said, can I let you in on a secret? They're not. (laughs) They are stingy, greedy, blood-sucking individuals. (laughs) I said, I didn't give you that because I'm an American. I gave you that because I'm a Christian. Because I'm a believer. 
and because I believe in you, and I believe God has a plan for your life. And then I got to share the gospel with her. It was that easy, and she had, it surprised her. I mean, it messed her whole world up because it was so surprising. People don't expect it. They don't expect somebody to forgive them before they deserve it. They don't expect it. It's surprising when it happens. See, when we do stuff like that, when we live like Jesus has called us to live, when we walk like Jesus has called us to walk, it's always questionable and surprising. But you know what? People will also question your motives when you do stuff like that. They'll say, oh, he wants something. He's trying to get something. He's trying to earn some favor. He's trying to, to make his way into something. Because it's so surprising and it's so questionable, they don't know what else to do with it other than question, question your motives. But you know, they did the same thing to Jesus. I want you to look at Jesus. There's a lot of examples we could look at around this, but I want you to consider this text in John chapter 11. Jesus is at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Do you remember what some people said? Look at this. It, it says this. It says, when Jesus saw her crying... And the Jews who had come along with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. And then it says Jesus wept because he loved this family. He loved these sisters. He loved this young man. And then look at what the Jews said in verse 36. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said... Couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? They're questioning the motives of Jesus. Why didn't he help him? Why didn't he save him? If he really loved him, I mean, those can't be real tears, because if he really loved him, he wouldn't have let him suffer and die in the first place. They're questioning the motives of Jesus. Now, we know why it happened this way. We know why Jesus didn't go right away to save him. We know because we see what he told his disciples earlier in John chapter 11 and verses 1 through 4. It says, now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. And then Jesus when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. See, we know it had to happen this way for the glory of God to be revealed. We know this wasn't about false or questionable motives in Jesus' life. We know it was about the mission Jesus was on for his Father, of course, people didn't see it that way at that time, so they had to question Jesus' motives. They, they didn't know what else to do with it. Let's consider one more example. Let's consider the example of what Mary did for Jesus. Mary was just mentioned in the text. It says, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. You know, when she did that, there were some who questioned her motives, questioned why she would do such a thing. In John chapter 12, it says, Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Then one of his disciples said this, Why wasn't the perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Why is she doing this? And he goes on to say, he, he didn't say this because he really cared about the poor. He did this because he cared about himself, because he was a thief. But Jesus, he answered in verse 7, he said, leave her alone. She's kept it for the day of my burial. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. She's doing what she feels like is right. She brings this offering, this expensive offering to the Lord and pours it on him. And then people around start questioning her motives. What a waste. That money could have been used better. Why did she sacrifice so much? Why would she do that? Church, she's just living for Jesus and willing to give everything she has to Jesus, but that's surprising to the world. People, people can't understand that. 
And it's why I'm telling you, living for Christ, even today, is always going to seem questionable to most. Over the years, I've become more and more comfortable with people questioning my motives or the motives of our church. We get that a lot. I get it a lot. I'm sure you do as well when you're out in the community and people find out you go to church here. And when I hear people doing that, I used to spend a a lot of time defending our motives for things. But now I just kind of sit back, smile, nod my head, and in my head and in my heart, I think, you know what, that probably means we're on the right track. Because when the world is questioning your motives, you're, you're probably doing something right for the Lord. When what you're doing is so surprising that people don't know what to do with it, you're probably on the right track. See, when you decide to surprise the world and live for Jesus, you can be certain, I mean absolutely certain, church, that people are going to question your motives along the way. And that's okay if you're living a questionable life on purpose for the kingdom. You know what else they'll question? Number two, they'll question your methods. Not just your motives, but they'll question your methods. They did it to Jesus. They're going to do it to us. We get this a lot here at Cowboy Fellowship as well. Honestly, we've gotten this from the very beginning. People will say things like, well, well, why do you do rodeo events? That's not a Christian thing. That's not a church thing. Why do y'all do arena events? We're going to have a huge arena event today after church. Why do y'all plant so many churches when you could use that money right here in Atascosa County? Why do you send so many people on mission trips? Why do, you, why do you do so much mission work when there are so many right here who need help? Why do you do the fall festival when everybody knows that Halloween is the devil's holiday? The list just goes on and on and on and on. And it used to really bother me. There was a time in my ministry and in my life when I spent way too much time trying to defend the methods God has called us to. Way too much time. Over time, I've just come to realize that living for Jesus will always be questionable to most people. Please hear me. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying we get everything right. But I can honestly say we have done our best to boldly follow the Holy Spirit into places most churches and people will never go. And to do things most churches, most people, and most Christians just simply will not do because they're too worried about what the world is going to think. They're more worried about that than what God has called them to do. We've had many, many methods over the years that have surprised the world and made such an impact for the kingdom of God. And that's good. It's a really, really good thing. It's okay when you surprise the world and you're living a questionable life or have a questionable ministry in this way because here's, I'll tell you why. Because it was the same way for Jesus. Living for Jesus looks that way if you're following in his footsteps. Again, just consider the life of Christ. He ran into the same kinds of things all the time. In Luke chapter 5, verses 30 through 32, here's a great example. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why would you do that, Jesus? Why, 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 why would you practice such an unorthodox, unholy thing? They're questioning the method of Jesus to get the gospel to the world who needed it. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And you know what Jesus said to him? It's in the very next verse, verse 31. He says, and this is so simple. He says, it's not those who are healthy who need a doctor. It's those who are sick. He says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So it makes sense that I would be with sinners. You see, this method of reaching people in Jesus' day was unheard of. It was unorthodox, and it was totally unacceptable for a rabbi like Jesus. And it made the other religious people, man, it just made them so uncomfortable. It made their skin crawl. 
They didn't know what to do with it. So what do they do? They question his methods. It was a very questionable thing to do, after all. Or consider other verses and passages like Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, when it says this, on another Sabbath, he entered a synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The scribes and Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Another one of his methods was healing on the Sabbath. They were doing that so they could find a charge against him. But look at verse 8. But he knew their thoughts, and he told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up, stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, or to do evil, to save a life, or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he told them, Stretch out your hand. He didn't wait for them to give him permission. He asked them the question. They didn't want to answer it. So he says, Put your hand out. Put it out, big boy. And then his hand was restored, it says. And you would think they were filled with awe and wonder. You would think they would be happy for the man who had been healed. But oh no, look at verse 11. They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. For practicing such an awful method of healing somebody, saving somebody, blessing somebody on the Sabbath of all things. And at all times and of all places, they didn't know what they were going to do with this man. They're less surprised about this man's hand being healed and restored than they are at the questionable method of healing that Jesus practiced on the Sabbath. It happens again in Luke 13. It frequently happened like this around the Sabbath. It says, but the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, there's six days... When work should be done, therefore come on those days to be healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites, doesn't each of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated But the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. Doing all of this work of God on the Sabbath brought the methods of Christ into question. It was a questionable thing to do, a questionable way to live, surprising to the world in which he lived. But then again, isn't that how God frequently works in these questionable and surprising ways? As I've said from the beginning, for you and I, living for Christ will always seem questionable to most. I want to share one last area with you that will be called into question if you really live your life for Jesus. And this one's going to seem seem, um, less obvious than the first two. And at first you might even go, well, how could that be? But let me just tell you, it just is. It happened to Jesus, it'll happen to you if you really live your life for the Lord. People will question your loyalty to your master. They'll, if you're really living for Jesus, they'll question your loyalty to Jesus. They'll question your loyalty to God. This happened to Jesus on multiple occasions. While he's doing his ministry on earth, when questioning his motives didn't stop him, when questioning him his methods didn't stop him, they said, well, you know what? Let's elevate this. We're going to question your devotion and your loyalty to God, to your master. And you got to remember who Jesus is. Jesus is following God's plan 100%. Amen? He's fulfilling God's mission 100%. Amen? Amen. He's doing God's will with absolute perfection. Amen? Amen? And yet people still found a reason to question who he was following. So don't be surprised when they question you. John chapter 8, check it out. John chapter 8, verse 48 The Jews responded to him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? (laughs) They're telling Jesus he's got a demon problem. I don't have a demon, Jesus answered. On the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. He says, I do not seek my own glory. There's one who seeks it and judges. Truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. 
And then the Jews said, now we know, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death, you demon. (laughs) They're, They're fighting mad about this. Are you greater than our father Abraham, they go on. And the prophets, are you greater than all of them? And then they ask Jesus this question. They say, who who do you claim to be, demon? And Jesus responds. He he says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. My father about whom you say, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You, You do not know him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Church, can I just tell you, throughout his ministry, Jesus made it clear that he was about one thing more than anything else. He said, I'm about the glory of God. The glory of my father. I'm here to fulfill his mission, his purpose. I'm not here to glorify me. I'm here to glorify him. He made that abundantly clear to everybody when he was teaching parables, when he was performing miracles. He's making that clear. He's he's broadcasting that to the whole world. And yet we find example after example after example of them coming to Jesus and saying, you're not loyal to God. You're a demon. Look at John chapter 7. We we see so much right, right in the gospel of John. We don't even have to leave John. John 7, 16 through 18, Jesus answered them, my teaching isn't mine, but it's from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether his teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there's nothing unrighteous in him. Look at John 12, 27 through 28. Another example, Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that's why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Or John 13, 31 and 32. When he had left, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Jesus was totally sold out and loyal to God. He was totally committed to the mission, to the plan, to the purpose. But his life was so surprising to the world, people didn't know what to do with it. It was so questionable. They had few options. See, when you're living a questionable, surprising life for the Lord, for the gospel, for the kingdom, people don't know what to do with that. They they don't have many options Really, all they can do is criticize your motives, criticize your methods, and if that doesn't work, criticize your loyalty to the master and to God. And church, here's the sad thing. I think we can all see how this works. We've we've all experienced this in our lives. But here's the sad thing. Most of the time, that's all that's needed to get us to just sit down, shut up, and stop doing whatever God has called us to do. Most of the time when people start questioning our motives or our methods or accuse us of not being loyal to God and to the church and to the gospel, most of the time we just shrink back, crawl in a little hole, take cover, and stop. And that's why it's so important we understand what this study is about. And that's why it's critical that you understand here at the beginning that living for Christ will always seem questionable to most. Don't be surprised when you are living your life for the gospel and for the kingdom and people question things. It's supposed to be that way. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some very simple, some very surprising things we can all do in the normal course of our lives to look more like Jesus, to be more like Christ, to make a bigger impact with the gospel in the world. But I'm going to tell you right now, these things are going to seem questionable to most because living for Christ will always seem questionable to most. I want to close by saying this. 
When I consider what God did for me by sending Jesus from heaven down to earth to die for my sins, to set me free, to pull me out of literally the grips of the devil and his demons in the pit of hell and to restore me to life. I find it very surprising and I find it very questionable. Amen? Amen. His motive was love. He loved us before we ever loved him. He didn't do it because he had to. He did it because he loved us. That was his motivation. That was his motive. His method was the cross. Gosh, in my heart, and my mind, I just think there had to have been a better way. Why would he do that? Why would he go there? Why would he suffer in that way for me? But that was the method. And he was so loyal to his master, to God, that he was willing to go to that cross for me. Surprising and questionable for sure. Reminds me of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Because I know when most of us consider the motive and the method of Jesus and the gospel that I've just shared with you, that he died for you and died for me, when most of us hear that for the first time or the second time or the 21st time or the 150th time, when most of us hear that, we go, you know what, that's surprising and super questionable. I just don't know. Paul nailed it. Verse 18, he said, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. It's not surprising when people don't grasp it and get it Because the word of the cross is foolishness when you're perishing. Church, I pray that you wouldn't leave here today without accepting the goodness, the grace, and the love of God. I pray you would move from that place of foolishness and not understanding it to a place where you experience the power of God in your life and you are saved. Jesus died for you. He cares about you. He loves you. He gave his life so you could live. Repent, confess, believe, and be saved today. Let's pray. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pray with me. There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a prayer between you and God, and I want to help you lead you in this time. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand. We're not going to ask you to come to the front. Meet us at the back. It's between you and the Lord. You just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would forgive me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would save me, change me. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy, for dying on the cross for me. Father, as we close today, we thank you for the questionable nature of the cross, for the way that even after all these years, when we think on it and dwell on it, pray about it, Lord, when we consider the wondrous nature of the gospel and the cross, we are still surprised. Surprised by it. Lord, surprised that you would love us where we were, as we were, so much that you didn't want to leave us there. Surprised by the fact that you would give your life for us so that we could live surprised by the sacrifice that was required to save our souls from hell. Father, we just say thank you. Lord, we recognize it is not easy to live surprising and questionable lives in a world that 
when we do so, we'll come and question our motives and our methods and even our loyalty to you. But Father, I pray you give us the courage to do it anyway, to complete whatever mission and purpose you have for our lives, for your glory, this day, this week, this year, through the course of this study. Lord, we thank you, and we ask that you would help us to walk just as you walked. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Pete. Thanks so much for watching this sermon from Cowboy Fellowship. We hope you enjoy it. I want to ask you, if you don't mind, be sure you hit the subscribe button, the like button, and then leave a comment, an encouraging word down below. All three of those things are so encouraging to us. They also help with the YouTube algorithm and help us as we're trying to get the good news out to the world. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for being a part of our online family. We pray God blesses you today.